Hello, everybody, and welcome to Immortal Gates of Pyre. The, well, actually, playing with Pyre, the Immortal Gates of Pyre fan, fan podcast. We cannot see their faces, and I'm going to try to fix that immediately. As uh, yeah, I can't see Dom's face, so let me fix that real quick because I want to see his face on stream. Hey, Dom, how are you doing? I'm invisible. Oh, you're back. Oh, I am. Oh. Yeah, it didn't last long, I unfortunately. I get to be invisible. I think oh. one. And Zard appears. Hopefully Zard <laughs> appears. There we go. So, hello, everybody. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. Zard forgot he can't teleport home. Uh, he will know next time that it takes a bit longer to get home, but that's okay. Uh, we have him now on stream, and we are very happy to have him. We have a fun episode today where we are mostly going to focus on 1v1. As uh, last week, we went a bit about overall about Immortal, and this week we'd like to concentrate a bit more on the meta, what's happening, especially with uh, the tournament that just happened with a few upsets, but won't spoil you, spoil you quite yet on who the winner is. And yeah, so how are you doing, Dom and Zard? Well, Dom first. I'm doing all right. I've, I don't know, it's been, it's been a interesting week. I mean, I was doing the last tournament, so it's been, since then, not a whole lot's changed. Just had a kind of relaxing weekend. Yeah. And yeah. Zard, how about you? I am coughing real under that, so Ooh. good old influenza, everyone's favorite. <laughs> Definitely. Well, for those who don't know us, we are regular people that love Immortal Gates of Pyre, so me and Dom are usually uh, have often been co cast on the weekly tournament, while Zard is the producer behind the scenes. We've seen a lot of the game, so we just decided to start this fan podcast to talk even more about it, because... You know, we, we can never talk too much about Immortal. There you go. Zard's going to be a bit bigger. Yeah, I'm just going to change the screen a bit with Zard. So yeah, uh, before we get started, let's start with something a bit more fun. So, Dom, can you tell me what's something fun you learned about Immortal this week, if you have anything? And I'm going to ask the same question as Zard afterwards, and I'm putting Dom on the spot and he hates it, but that's okay. I don't mind. <laughs> oh, this week... Yeah, what did I learn this week? Uh, well, I I learned that Behemoth is still usable. Definitely. We did see the Behemoth in the tournament. We saw the beautiful tail going up and down. Uh, we saw Hydraulics going crazy about it. And yeah, that was a fun moment. And Zard, you must have learned something amazing about the, the game this week. Let's see. This week, I'm watching Magical play in the tournament and learned about a specific play style that re in regards to the early game that takes eight mass hunters to specifically go secure pyre and then you actually delay the god heart tech such that you can get yourself tens of calls to go with that and what happens is you get eight mass hunters and then those are your anti-air for there's a call push because it apparently when you hit uh it's when you hit with that timing you can have the eight hunters tens of calls and the ability to kind of bulldoze your way through um, any like Karath composition that is there, and you have Pyre advantage, so you have infuses, and then okay, you're we're going to go through that a bit later, Zard. <laughs> I'm going to cut you off for now. We're going to the details of that yeah. a bit later, because uh, <laughs> today is an episode of one v one, and that fits perfectly in the theme. Uh, before we go straight to that, I'd like to talk about the community contribution of the week. Uh, so I think we've all seen it six to seven times so far a video that yep. uh, <laughs> made the news the last few days uh giant grand games shows off that showed us a beautiful video called the next rts major rts will fail this is why so in this video giant grand games talks a bit about uh, strategy games in general and in particular the rts genre that hasn't had really a big success in starcraft 2 age of empires 4 came out not too long ago there are a few other major players coming out and yeah, so why why won't this work? So I'll just go through the points quickly. Anyone who wants to watch a video, it's a 25 minute video, but it's very interesting. So I recommend it for everyone. So first off, the first point is uh, there is a large player base for RTS, uh, for strategy games in general. I think you all agree that there's a large player base. However, most of it is casual and that can hurt a bit with uh, what, what some designers prefer where they concentrate really on the hardcore or whatnot. Uh, so that's basically the first point. Uh, second point, there's a, certainly a bad perception about RT, about strategy games in general. We have a very welcoming crowd in our uh, in this genre, but 
there's a bad perception of being too hard and some people don't want to get into that hard of a game. And then he gets into the meat of the subject, I'd say. So what did old RTS do right? What makes a game good? So the first part is the engine. So what is the engine? It's units feeling slap, snappy, how you control the units. And I think Dom can, can tell me a bit more about how he feels about uh, games like that, about what defines the engine and like what's a good feeling about uh, the game making you want to play it. I mean, the simplest way to put it is that you click and the unit goes. It's it's really subtle, however. It's not just a matter of being able to like tell the unit to go in a certain place. It's a question of timing. Like, if it takes too long to rotate, or if it takes too long to accept the command in the first place, or if it feels like you're trying to like correct for something based on, oh, you're seeing your opponent's moving and your units aren't responding fast enough. But it's really tough because on the one hand, Ideally, every single time, every single time you, commit, you issue an order, the following frame you see the units start actually executing that order. The problem is twofold. One, there's a lot of units, and so there's got to be some. Like, if all of them did, that's a pretty big load on the CPU for all the pathfinding and any of the vision checks and all that stuff that has to happen. So you have to kind of make sure you. Have a system so that when units are given orders, there's as much as possible that's done in advance and cached or otherwise that's not being done immediately. But the problem is the less you do immediately, the less responsive the units feel. The second problem, of course, is networking, which compounds that because now you have to deal with synchronizing that across the network. And if you're dealing with a lot of units or if you're dealing with a game that, say, has like actual physics simulations involved, then that can involve a lot more processing time and also a lot more network data so then you're trying to optimize for that which can then lead to situations where units may only respond to your commands after like five or six frames which it can feel okay it can feel terrible for I me mean, original starcraft only would take your orders once i think every like 12 12 times a second i think so effectively once every five frames yeah which that doesn't feel the worst but the point is that it, there's all these trade-offs and what's important is to make to try to reduce that input delay as much as possible and try to reduce the sense that the units are just not listening. Yeah, so basically you That's want snappy unit control, which... You, you want know, snappy unit control. Yeah, which StarCraft II really perfected more than most other uh, strategy games that we've seen, I feel. And, you know, mm -hmm. at least uh, Zardy can agree on that or disagree. Immortal does a pretty good job at that as well, right? Yeah, I think I think it does a pretty decent job. One thing that uh, one thing that is interesting about Immortal is that it does like include turn rates, but it also at the same time I don't know it could just be personal bias on my part because like I play Dota and I play other games with turn rates and so I could just be used to it. But it also manages to feel snappy even with the presence of of turn rates in my opinion. So and therefore you like you have fine unit control. You can easily do pullback micro and uh, which is like pretty key when it comes to specific back and you know aru yep. with their snap shield really likes pullback micro and so i haven't run into any issues in terms of like getting used to it and being able to do pullback micro so that I think it works out i think the thing i've noticed with immortals units and i at least i think i've noticed is that when you move them around they don't rely on turning in order to determine movement direction yeah that's they're true. for aiming but they will move they will walk backwards yep yeah, yeah. units are very responsive that's kind of with the behemoth that's the year right like when you when I you mean, click the behemoth it starts it starts moving instantly mm -hmm. and it starts turning slowly so yeah so in any case that is the first pillar of what uh grant defines as something you need to get right in your game it's to have that engine running well to have controls that feel snappy responsive you can do whatever you want and yeah, at least for Immortal's case, it seems to be in the right direction. Of course, there's going to be constant updates on that front. But for now, it seems good. The second one is the spectacle. Uh, so I think, I think, and Zard, you can pick this one up. What is the spectacle, Zard? Spectacle is basically, does it look cool? Yep. Are you blowing crap up? Are you do using cool random effects? Does everything like... When you, I, I like, I like putting it almost as a, in terms of a wow factor. If you look at a visual effect, 
does it make you go, wow, that was sick. That was amazing. Because the more of that you have where people who are looking at the game think that that is amazing and cool, the more people are going to want to engage with it, right? As Santa Claus says, thrones. The throne is very good at this. I think the Sharu is pretty decent at this too. And I, I look forward to what the visual team has in store for Immortal in those regards as well. Yeah, no, I can see that coming, definitely. Uh, you want to add something, Dom? Oh, yeah, I was about to say that the the thing with spectacles is that it's... And this is something where I feel like, honestly, that 2D games had a bit of an advantage, which is that it's the really... The tricky thing with spectacle is that you got to make sure that it's flashy and cool and bombastic, but you can still see what's going on. And sometimes spectacle can really help. Death animations are a good example of spectacle that helps you know what's going on. But it's also, like, it's really a careful dance of finding the right thing to show off that doesn't obscure vision uh, it's honestly something i find the command and conquer games especially the later ones have a bit of trouble with is that it can become a i mean they're seeing on screen right now become <laughs> real mess of particle effects and become difficult to see what's going on and so you want to have it be flashy but you want the flashiness to also be snappy and i think honestly a lot of what it comes down to is more just how stuff looks when it's not exploding because yep. that's like that stuff you can see and read it and so the, the process of explosion should be quick and should be cool but shouldn't be obstructive yep. and that's a really tough balance yeah for sure the second part they touch in this in this part about the uh, presentation is just you know sometimes it's just cool to have an ability that can destroy the whole map so a new can starcraft do or I'm sure there's tons of better example of nuke-like ability that can destroy stuff, of course. There are tons of examples of literal nukes. Most yeah. Command Conquer games, again, have literal nukes that are very destructive. There we go. <laughs> Total Annihilation and its successors, like Spring Commander, have nukes that just wipe out square kilometers of space. There's, there's a lot. Yeah, the solution to that, of course, is not having necessarily a multiplayer. And having it in single player can be the option or PvE player versus the, the AI or whatnot. Uh, all of those solutions help to make that possible, even if you so just to keep the multiplayer in line. So, and of course, we know Immortal has that uh, planned out. The PV have it planned out pretty, pretty well, uh, pretty far ahead, right? I think so. And I'm, yeah. I have to ask the devs. No, it has. I does Zard, but <laughs> Zard seems to know a lot about the the PV content coming up. But <laughs> yeah. Um... Actually, that's funny because I don't actually know a ton what? about the PvE content. Like, yeah, they're just like they, they have co-op commanders, co-op missions. I mean, the whole basis of the immortal is that it could be, it can be a co-op commander. You can have big, cool stuff, right? In, yep. in, in co-op, and like, I don't, I don't quite know like what form or structure they want to, they want that's to true. take on the actual content like that's not something the developers have really talked about like we know that there will be co-op missions and we know that there will be like cool effects and we know that there will be you know cool hats for your immortal and stuff like that but i don't know what that's going to look like in, in the long run i don't think many of us know that's true that's, I... that's going to look like in their own room. they haven't talked a lot about that see i just so have See, I just have an idea because they say whenever we have there's something in uh, the dark design channel that's just too crazy. Oh, yeah, we'll put that in PVE. It's like okay, that that's where they're putting all their crazy stuff. They seem to be ready for that to uh, push it forward in the next stage instead. Yeah, but yeah. One, no one thing that was interesting, like one specific suggestion I really liked out of dark design channel, like was one about thrums. They like shoot railroad spikes. That that's kind of like their their attack in the lore. So therefore, what you can do is you can have something like you literally impale in enemy troops with railroad spikes that come from your thrums. And then so you, you have, have a train track that follows, right? That's where you're going with that? <laughs> well, you have to put the train track first. Wait, see, that's, that's, the, that's the synergy. Like, oh, right. That's another dark thing I've heard about is the idea of having different like pairs of factions have faction like duo tech specific things where like this would be the Jora Aru one. Where Jorah's laying down track, and then the thrums go and shoot down the railroad spikes. It's and if someone's in the way, I guess that's their fault. <laughs> it's the most elaborate setup to get someone stuck on a train track and then <laughs> run over by a train ever. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe not quite that far, but you know, like there, there's 
lots of cool stuff in the Dark Divine channel for sure. Yeah, there's yeah. some room for some crazy <laughs> stuff for sure. I'm, I'm Sorry, looking forward Noel. to it. No, he's gonna he's gonna be fine with that. He's gonna make that, I'm sure. <laughs> in any case, we can head to the final category that he uh, that Giant Grand Games talks about. It's the Dev Tools. So what he means by dev tools is having community map makers. So in Warcraft 3, Starcraft 2, Starcraft Brood War, they had a huge, huge, huge uh, map editor that let you create your own games where genres like, uh, well, MOBAs came out of this, tower defenses came out of it. And he just vaunts the, the merit of having something like that in your game to allow, allow, allow users to make their own content. Any thoughts on that, so Dom? So this is three things. Yeah. Actually, this isn't a map editor. This is three map editors. The first is one that almost every game gets right. And in my personal opinion, I think that while blizzards are good, I think my favorite one of these is Rise of Legends. And that's the terrain editor, mm, right. which is the thing that actually controls laying out all the ground, laying out all the doodads, laying out any like decorative stuff, laying out where you spawn, laying out any of the neutral stuff. That's part of the game. All Laying that stuff out. And that's something almost every strategy game has. There are very few that don't because it's very easy. Like it's something that you're, you're going to build in the process of making the game and it's something that's fairly straightforward to expose to the user. Yeah, because the dev the also need to make the maps, right? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. It's, it's not that big of a difference. The second thing is data editing, which most games get to some degree where you can modify what the units are, like different stats, different... Like Sometimes you can modify the place in the tech tree or the requirements, that sort of thing, or what builds what generally like name stats that kind of thing is the easiest thing that gets done and that's fine it can give you some interesting little mutators or mods it's not the biggest deal it's an important component however of the last one which is the scenario editor that is the most important thing and that's the thing that i would argue blizzard's the only company that's gotten right ever <laughs> i have never seen any other game with a scenario editor that didn't rec that worked like I've seen a couple of games where you could theoretically do scripting, like Lua scripting or some kind of proprietary language scripting that you could then kind of make work. But that's really unintuitive. Like that's, that's a lot to work with. Even if you know, even if you're a professional programmer, it's still, you know, still have to run code as opposed to the way that Blizzard's games have typically done it, which is very much this kind of snap in system where you just have, you have triggers, and those triggers just do various things. They're they're just event. It's just an event loop, and you just set what is going to trigger that event, and then what that event triggering will do. And StarCraft is a little bit harder to navigate this way. Warcraft Three was amazing with this, and still had oh, a yeah. scripting backend if you really wanted to. But that's that to me is the key part that no art, no strategy game has gotten right yeah. outside of Blizzard's. Or, that's. They've, Blizzard's catalog is the only thing that's done this since yeah. StarCraft Brood War. Yeah. So the reason he brings this up is afterwards he talks about user-created content, which is the lifeblood of many games. Having user-created content is what keeps Skyrim alive. It what made, well, Minecraft. Minecraft is a game about user-created content, really. Oh, so yeah. a big part of it. And of course, there, there's a few examples of games like that. User-created content is what makes the game go. But I see Dom, you want to say something right now. Oh, I mean, the oh, okay. thing with Minecraft is that it's just the... It is all about the user-created content, yeah, exactly. but in that case, you can get away with what is effectively just the data editing. Like, the yeah. map editing is obviously auto-generated. The the thing that you mod in is new tech, new animals, new yeah. types of resources, that sort of, that sort of thing. So it's, it's a different sandbox to play with and one that requires less work on the dev side in order to create the community tools that keep it going. Yeah, but it's really all about getting that user-created user content, right? Create, uh, users can create their own content and then bring it to other users and you create a community around that and all that and yeah that's Just something for, that brings it for strategy games there's a there's a bigger barrier for entry in terms of what you how you can make it truly free form for the users yeah compared to starcraft or sorry starcraft, compared to minecraft yeah. or or skyrim or skyrim thank you yeah well yeah. skyrim is just Different yeah, because that's kind of unofficial. But what with Minecraft, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just getting the modding tools and all that. Uh, yeah, I think that was pretty much it. Do you have any other words on that, Zarn? Oh, uh, yeah. I was just thinking about in terms of like scenario editors. I think the other closest one was the the other one that ended up working. I think was the Dota editor. Oh uh, yes, because yeah, yeah Auto Chess was made in that, wasn't it? Yeah, Auto yeah. Chess was made there. It was it was actually crazy when that happened. Like the the numbers 
of pe- the num sheer numbers of people that crowded into the Dota arcade to play auto chess was like actually crazy. Like y- you're sitting there, it was like 120,000 people playing Dota auto chess, and I was like sitting there going like. Is that really like the actual number of people playing? It was kind of like I'm sorry yeah. to see, you actually, know. And then of course, well, it went on to be its own thing, and multiple yeah. different companies picked it up, etc. Yeah. It was really cool. Actually, that does remind me though, because of course that's Valve, and the one thing that, like, I mean, you know, obviously there's a lot of mods and game modes and such for like Half-Life Two, yeah. And that was, but that's, I mean, that's because it's the engine. Right, like at that point, you're just using Hammer Editor's edit source engine. Yeah, and that's kind of what it comes down to is how easy it is to manipulate effectively the game's engine. And I don't mean Unreal yeah. in the case of Immortal. I mean like the Immortal engine, effectively. Yeah, because with Immortal, you'd actually need to. So I mean, it's a scenario editor in its simplest form. Well, in its simplest form, it would be a scenario editor, and that's what you kind of want, just so you can create your your own tower defenses or create a new genre if you want. Of course, Immortal is going to, is coming out with uh, Wave Wars twists on Direct Strike or Nixx Wars, so there's going to be some content that's uh, open to all. But of course, having multiple millions of developers can, can, can open up a few more avenues, I suppose. Sheer amount of stuff eventually will create an epic idea that ends up sticking with a lot of people, right? Yeah, it's like. So now a bit of a harder hitting question. So we know Immortal at its start, they want that obviously, but it's not necessarily part of their launch plan. Uh, do you think it's as necessary as Giant Grand Games is putting it out as? as? Because, you know, we want we all want Immortal to succeed massively. And Giant Grand Games just says, it's something you absolutely need to be a massive success. So can it still work if it comes a bit later? If it never comes at all, what are your thoughts on that? They have two months, six months, if they add extra modes over the course of that develop, developed by them themselves. But that would come at the cost of being able to develop more mortals and yeah. that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. And I think, though, yeah, it's it may be difficult, honestly, when you think about it, because they'll also have to be transitioning from building the video game to building the... To video game the builder. Game to service at the same time. So they're, they're kind of doing two things in that regard. They'd be, one, building a scenario editor, and then to transitioning to an, a team that's able to maintain the game. And well, again, that's why that's why they brought up in the video, and I agree with this, that you want to make the scenario editor early and then use that as a dev tool, both to save your own time and also because that way you can transition into having it be a community side dev tool. Which yeah. I'd imagine yeah. that the complication... I mean, I don't know what the complication is because there's two possibilities, and I realize I'm dead in the chat, so speculation may be kind of mooted quite quickly. The first is that they're using Unreal Engine. And I don't know offhand what Epic's licensing terms for a sub-engine or editor within the engine are. I think they're fairly liberal about it, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, there might be fun. some additional negotiations that are required. The second problem is that it might not be so much a matter of making dev tools that are usable, because making dev tools that are usable within your own development team is different from making dev tools that are generally usable to a community that isn't necessarily developers familiar with it yeah. and that's that is the huge thing and granted there are like a lot of the simplification systems things like triggers and so forth as an example are something that you be kind of building on top of an existing scripting system as a way of wrapping it yeah and that isn't necessarily necessary from the perspective of the development side because the development side knows well enough what they're doing that it's fine it's their job they're doing it with knowledge insider knowledge of how it's supposed to work they've come up with it so the user facing stuff may just be more a matter of constructing or wrapping what they have in a way that's relatively accessible and then still like allowing for the more advanced stuff if you really want to dig into it yeah and as you but said that, that wrapping that ui is probably a big part of the delay that's planned or the fact that it's not necessary or the fact that it's sort of this there might be a bit of a delay in how long it takes to come out. Yeah, and as you said, that would also help the development process eventually, since anyone could, at that point could be able to uh, pick it yes. up at least a bit easier to uh, to create their own scenes, their own their own campaign that might come in eventually, or all the co-op scenarios could come through that as well. Yeah. yeah, I also wonder if there's a third barrier, like like legally legal things have been mentioned, but like 
if you consider user generated content, I know in Dota that oh, there has been um, okay. yeah. There has been it's not quite copyright. It's it's more the question of how would Unreal and Epic Games manage and you like deal with user generated mods from a sub engine of Unreal Engine generating uh, revenue for people for the people that are creating the mods there. And yeah. so, it's well, like I said, that's a licensing have... question. That's yeah. that's the initial licensing yeah. question I was wondering about. Yeah, and all yeah, that so is available. Yeah, at least that's like kind of a mess, right? Like, what are you gonna do about that? Yeah, well, I don't know. It really comes down <laughs> to the decision between Sunspear and Epic, honestly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they'll they'll they'll, oh, they'll figure something else. Yeah, security stuff. Seamus has a point. There's the the last thing is making sure that the editor is airtight. Oh right. That doesn't yeah. present an attack surface for things like arbitrary code execution, yeah, which is a really true. good point. That didn't even occur to me, but that is a thing. No, that's for sure. Yeah, you don't want someone to just steal everything that. or yeah. Yeah, destroy the stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I mean, also there's 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 the point where it's like, okay, well. You find that if you manage to find those hacks within like that user generated content, like I don't know, that, that that also like it begs the question like how good is the immortal security, right? I mean, they have like that client side authority that, or sorry, not client side authority, server side authority that they've been using in sure. order to like try and make sure there's no map hacks and nothing like that. So like, I guess the question becomes like, well. Or, would you end up finding hacks to the server side authority kind of thing or maybe I mean, the, thing I was, the thing i'd be thinking of more is and actually probably yeah because the thing you've got to remember it's server side authority but the server itself is running your mod right, right. Your, so mod, you your map managed... goes onto the server so unless they make sure that they have to make sure that the, there is no real attack surface available yeah. otherwise it would mean that you've uploaded something to the server that is able to do stuff and having to vet mods and maps and so forth would completely it would cut the legs out from underneath the modding thing so that has to be something Perfect, yeah. that is done in advance like they cannot right. do it by hand yeah by screening things it has to be the base system itself needs to be airtight right yeah. that's that makes it a little harder is like it's, it's it does, not yeah. such a... again one of those things the transition from dev to community is that's one of the hurdles where the devs could have it but giving it to the community is there's that one extra step in any yeah. case i think we've gone up on most of the subject like seem was talking about security and yeah uh but yeah no that i do think this was a great video by giant grand games and as you said i think the user generated content is pretty key but is it necessary well we'll have to see if uh if immortal doesn't start with it and yeah well that's uh i think that's it for uh for this subject on the giant grand games and yeah a really good uh really good video i think was yes hmm? if you yeah, haven't watched it yet go go watch that video because we did what we could to avoid repeating points so grant has his own points on this stuff which are worth listening to yeah definitely so in that case i think we're done with talking of community contributions thank you grant i do believe he's in discord server as well so anyone who's watching who's not on discord feel free to join don't the discord him because don't ping like we generally don't want people to be pinging no definitely people not who are like vips or whatever it's yeah you don't want to bother them yeah definitely don't ping them uh, but yeah, feel free to join the Discord. Uh, you can talk. Uh, you can talk with different community members. Talk about what they think about the video. Post it one more time so we can talk about the video all together. And yeah, every single time it's posted, there's been talks <laughs> popping up about it. So I don't mind if it comes in eight, nine, ten. Okay, actually, all I would end up times. mining. I would mine after eight <laughs> times probably. Well, it's one more time. One more time to find out. <laughs> in any case, I think we're ready to go back to full on immortal. Of course, this was pretty linked to immortal. Uh, but Fallen Immortal in the past week, one of the major things we had was a patch. So we had pi patch notes we can see in game updates. So I'll just go through what I think are the main points. Uh, first one I want to bring up is co-op has some updates. So UI is a bit clearer. You, uh, you can, there's some levels. Everything is a bit better for co-op. Have you guys tried co-op yet? Since the I patch? I have a chance to since the new patch now. Mm. I have not touched co-op. I'm a competitive Fine, fine. Person. <laughs> I touched it before it did that. I'm I'm really curious actually because I found when I was doing co when I played through co-op it wasn't so much the lack of scoring, it was just that the whole thing was really unclear about what was supposed to go on. So maybe they've adjusted that too and I'd be 
I expect they probably have. Oh, yeah, so, they have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, yes, definitely. they actually have explained that. That's perfect. That's the change I really like to see. Yeah, no, exactly. So you have five bases you can take. You have enemies attacking you constantly. You can upgrade your score by killing the other structures. And then you lose because you destroy the structures and there's more and more enemies spawning. And you can't deal with them all. Uh, so yeah, but cool. That's how that works. Oh yeah, there's only oh. twenty waves now. There's <laughs> max twenty waves. Oh, see, I didn't see. I didn't realize that build, killing structures was what increased difficulty. I thought you just had to wipe it all out, and so I started wiping it all out with the person I was playing with. And I mean, we actually ended up basically wiping it all out, but then stuff respawned, and I thought, okay, well, what's supposed to happen? Yeah, no, so, yeah. They've added text. That's great. That I should really try that again then. Yeah, and actually, all the structures are also defended, so there's a lot of omnivores and stuff. So you actually have to kill stuff too. Uh, you can't just kill it with nothing. There's stuff defending it, so it's not as easy as you'd think. So, actually, a nice squat map for now, and I encourage everyone that hasn't tried it out to go and try it out. It's a, a fun time. A second update we have a. Uh, Another UI update, I suppose. You can't uh, block town hall placement platforms or tower foundations by placing structures right next to them. So I like this one quite a bit. Just, you know, general quality of life stuff that you won't block your buildings from creating by placing something too close. Mm -hmm. Pretty nice. Not uh, much more to talk about. And now we will talk a bit about uh, the balance changes. So first one, the Sao Shin rework. Zar, take it away. What is the Sao Shin rework? Saoshin rework means that if you cast their leap, they no longer give everything in an AoE 90% damage reduction for three seconds, which means that the Saoshin no longer fits into literally every role in the game. Without those those roles being a frontliner, a I won't say a generalist, but a frontliner, <laughs> a dislodger, a Let's see. Uh, what what zone was the control, other thing? Arguably. zone control yeah. as well? Like zone control, you have you have a healer, so you have sustain. It's a support unit. It's a force multiplier. It's a. It's like I think that's four roles off the top of my head. So like, Sao Shin was powerful. Ooh, it's supposed to be support yeah. and slight this launcher. Right, like air denial. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was ridiculous, and so. No, that's it, magic. Air superiority, that yeah, more. it actually filled that role because it would give your Sharu 90% damage reduction. And so therefore you couldn't actually kill anything that they had in the air. It was really right. ridiculous. So, yeah, it, it got a nerf. And so now what we have instead is a full, it, it's an enormous heal. It did that to air units, yes. You okay. could not... Era, you could not run Aerox into your opponent's Sharu. Oh, that. Yep. Yeah. That, that's. Air yeah, denial. Yeah. That's actually kind of surprising. I don't think yeah, anyone expected that. It's very powerful. It. Uh, it, it, was, it was very powerful. It was stupidly strong. It kind of like created situations where the Ajari train would start running and then it would roll over you. It just go like. Yep. room and then you die and you're like well what am i supposed to do i, was, I guess i was supposed to just meet the saushin right outside the base over and over and over again because if they ever reach my front door i die so yeah it's it's, it's the it's the meme of how do, how do i stop saushin step one yeah. don't let them get saushin <laughs> <laughs> and then the saushin is a tier 1.5 unit and you die so okay it wasn't that dire but yeah the saushin was very powerful i don't yeah, want to say it was very powerful. You could, you know, stop it from setting up near you if it sets up near you. Then you're a bit more in trouble. You had to pick it up on the map. But yeah, it was hard to deal with for sure. So very happy with the nerf. As you said, yeah. it heals a lot of HP. Uh, it also has a leap ability. Its leap ability is mixed in with its heal. It also auto heals if it's low on HP. So a lot, lot, lot of uh, good changes there. I, I appreciate that too because what that means is like it's a very committed sort of heal where you go and you exchange your unit's HP for your opponent's HP, and then you pull them out, and then you heal them. So it's... Uh... Well, see, if the Deception are also the frontliners, that means they're going to get attacked, and then they'll heal automatically with anything around yeah. it as well. Yeah. So that's a... Yeah, and also it's less of a... Also, I think they changed a thing. It's a subtler thing, but I believe it was this patch where they changed it so that they land where you told them to. Yeah, yes, this is yeah, yes, it is They this land patch. where you told them to. It's, it's a low-key feature... But my goodness, do I appreciate that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've played Ajari much recently, but still, that was so frustrating. So, like, I just want to point that out, that Sao Shin Leap is working now. Yep. Yeah. In terms of position. 
that's yeah, going to be great for really cool having too. some ability. It's also really cool too because the Sao should actually have the ability to leap even if they aren't full mana at this point. So yes. that means that you can actually save your Sao Shin. Uh, they, they can leap in, they can heal themselves, or they can run in and then their heal pops and then you can leap them out yep. and you can maintain your Sao Shin so that way they can use their uh, yeah. they can use their ability next time. Yeah, I hope that's yeah, how we end up seeing that it. With conscious efforts. You're doing yeah. conscious efforts, you leap back, you heal the Zephyrs on your way back. Yep. Yeah. Well, also it's a 10 second, yeah, so you can't leap forward and back, so it's like, yeah, you go forward and you run away at, or the opposite, you jump into fray, but both of them are going to be yeah. uh, good ways of using it. Uh, yeah, let's go to the other big update. So the Scepter redesign, you could, you take it away, Dom. So Scepter, Scepter cannot be fully designed yet. There are some stuff that needs to be added in the game in order for it to work as intended. The way it was working before was that when you would be sitting in a spot, it would have AoE, which is a little bit awkward. I believe the intention, intended, intention initially was to have it have hollow ground, and there's some other stuff, but its current state is that instead of stabilizing causing it to have aoe it causes it to gain mana mana consu is consumed per aoe shot but it gains mana relatively quickly like it gains mana quickly enough that it can just keep firing aoe it's very clear however that was one of the biggest things because stable the stabilize mechanic is still a little bit unclear ux wise so it makes it yeah. a lot clearer you see it has mana if it has mana it does aoe which also means that if it's move it has to move slightly for whatever reason it might still be able to get a shot off because it only loses second mana as it's moving but if it has a lot of mana it might still get some aoe shots off it's a little bit more reliable from what i remember this is actually intended design um oh is it close oh, range cool. yeah and and to, and to make it more clear it's when you stabilize then they start gaining mana yeah yes. when once it moves it loses its mana as it moves if i remember yeah. right yeah it loses it loses mana while moving it gains mana while standing still it loses mana faster than it would gain it but it gains mana faster than it shoots yeah, yeah. so yeah set the redesign so big difference from the old patch where no well there's a cost to moving in and everything so that's going to be nice to to see how it turns out of course we did see some uh, play from the tournament, so we'll wait a bit before we go for that clip. Uh, before we head to the tournament, I just want to talk about the 1v1 meta in general. Uh, so yeah, 1v1 meta, how do you... Well, actually, I want to start off by talking about the maps. Because there are a few maps that we have. We have two, uh, we have two maps that we currently play in 1v1. Uh, let me just show them on the screen. As soon as I get that, there we go. I'm going to show it in a second and here we go so the first map is frontiers uh frontiers is of course one of the first maps that was the first map that was made for uh immortal uh but however it's not played much anymore dom do you have a, a good reasoning as why it's not played anymore mm, it's small yeah. i mean it's not okay so the thing is frontiers isn't a bad map lost province just enables a lot more and also enables a lot more if you're doing 2v2. Runtiers is really only good in 1v1. And once Lost Province dropped, everyone just moved to that. So I don't think Frontiers is bad. I just think that people had played Frontiers to death, and then Lost Province came out and just enables more macro play, which is fun. Yeah. So that's what people move to. Any what I think about it? Yeah, any thoughts on that? <laughs> what I think about it is that it's small, as you said, but it's also really constricted. Like, True. if you look at the way the map is laid out, there's only, like, one entrance to each base. So, therefore, if you wall off, there's not a lot you can really do in order to harass your opponent other than building air units. And so, therefore, what you end up with is there's just not a lot of ways to really harass your opponent. So, that's interesting. So, you think in the future most maps will have all the mains will have multiple entrances? Or just transport will fix that, I suppose. Or what are your thoughts on that? Some combination of transports fixing it, and I think having a less constricted map. Like if you look, like you have this main base down here in the bottom right, yep. and then just north of that, that's where your uh, that's where your expansion is normally. Like this right here, you have kind of two entrances into here. One of them leads to your third base, and with a tiny ramp right there, which you can just wall off. 
and then you have like one entrance here and then you have a tower covering the other entrance so there's like two places that you can kind of poke your opponent and both of them can be easily covered by towers and so therefore what you end up with is this giant fight for the middle uh, where you can't really kill your opponent unless you have like an enormous amount of pyre or you have dislodgers hey at least there's a lot of destructible rocks there that's something i i, I, I approve of and now let's talk about the 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 most uh, the the Finnish map. Let's put it that way. The only one v one Finnish map that uh, is tournament eligible. Lost Province. Uh, so yeah, what are your thoughts on this map in general, Dom? This map is one which enables a decent amount of macro play, and a lot of pyre play. Yeah. I mean, the two camps and the two pyre miners combined gives you a a lot to fight over in the center. And then the fact that you do have maps or do you have expansions along the corners as well means that you are also fighting along the corners because it's, I mean, general rule, people want to go down straight down the middle, one base to the other. So having all these expansions on the corners obviously makes for more pressure to go to the sides. Although typically, as we we see, players won't really do that until after they get their third because the thing with this map is that, much like Zard was saying one there's kind of one ish one and a half base entrances and they're not too hard to wall off so again your first your main and natural are very easily defended then the rest of it is extremely vulnerable the one exception there of the just like walking up the ramp into the main like if you kill the destructible rocks that lead into the main you just oh, walk yeah. your army up there and they gut your enemy's production if they aren't careful and actually watching it yeah, so, there's, like, there's the one saving grace yeah. in terms of harassability. Yeah, so we'll see. And it's a big saving grace. It's yeah. it's very much worth noting. You're right, Zard. Yeah. yeah, we'll see with future maps how much uh, more entrances and all that, because that seems to be the point of contention right now, just we want more places to attack instead of, you know, pretty straightforward macro, even though Lost Brawns are bigger. Is that pretty much what what you're saying? For future maps, let's say. What, what would be the wish list for a future map in 1v1? Hard to say, right? <laughs> it is, because like, with Lost Province, because it's 1v1, 2v2 hybrid, if it was pure 1v1, I... I don't know. I mean, the thing is, I kind of like the way that Embargo in particular works in 1v1, where it creates almost a spiral of bases. Hmm. Yeah. That is an interesting expansion pattern I don't see a whole lot of. So I like, I like that. I think in general, my wishlist would be experimenting a bit with different expansion patterns and experimenting with different like approaches. I do see where Zard's coming from in terms of having multiple entrances to the base, so that's yeah. that's cool. And I think if you had multiple expansion patterns on top of that, it then creates a question where like, some maps, it's like, oh, what different choices on which one to do. Like, front, like Frontiers, you have this choice of which expansion to take True. based on how it helps your territory control, but the maps being so claustrophobic kind of undermines that. That's true, because you can't take that. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, you could take the alloy only, for example, and like you're very well defended with a tower already there and rock, destructible rocks to have to, build, to to destroy to get through. Yeah, so like there's yeah. it's kind of moot at that point. Yeah. I think that I think that some kind of combination of experimenting with expansion patterns and experimenting a bit more with harassment harassability would be the thing to look for. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, in any case, I think we're. Oh, oops, that's not the game I wanted to load up. Uh, we can talk a bit about uh, the matchups themselves. So we talked a bit about 1v1 in general. Uh, now we can talk a bit about the matchup. The first one I want to talk about is Aru versus Aru, which kind of skipped over. This is the game, one of the tournament, which you casted Hydraulics. Uh, it was only that we had Aru versus Aru, so it's Mala versus Mala. Uh, Zard, how does this matchup usually open up? What's the early game like? Let's see. So typically what you see is the call openings. Simply because of the fact that a Zakal with its double damage passive is going to four shot a masked hunter. So, therefore, the. Uh, and on top of that, you have mass hunters do less damage to heavy units, which Zakals are. So, therefore, you end up with this dynamic where the Zakals are kind of able to just roll over the mass hunters and kill you. It's kind of, it almost feels like the gameplay pattern that Ajari used to have with the Sao ship, where they'd show up at your base, it would kill your whole army, and then it would just kill your base, and then you would lose the game. 
So as a result, all players, you can see there's a double altar thing going down here. All players typically go for the call yeah. as a kind of... Yeah, we see the neuro side going down as well here. So what you're so yeah, the opening is very much Zakal favor uh, Zakal focused, and then you move on to the next tech. So what are what's the mid game like? What type of tech do you go for? You, there are multiple choices, and so so I think at this point it diverges much more than opening Zakals, and then you diverge, right? Yeah, and so there's like a couple. Here's the thing. Here's the thing to know is that the process of diverging itself can be very lethal. That moment when you stop investing into the calls, if you take a bad fight and you're in the middle of transitioning, then you can just die because they just kill you because they have more more the calls. Because the Zakal versus a call matchup includes 50 damage a shot between the calls. Yeah, for so sure. therefore you, you end up with less the calls and they can just kill you. So what that means is that the matchup <coughs> can end up being rather punishing it's if you make a mistake you can end up just dying it's kind of like zvz in that regard in starcraft 2 yeah the road versus road battle um, um but yeah transitioning so the different yeah. transitions you have are you can go for mass hunters mass hunters don't work in the early game specifically because they die really quickly but in mid game if you go for a red veil and you get their upgrade well then they're able to fight and calls again and kind of chew through them because they're simply more damage dense they have a longer range they can attack they can focus fire much better fit more of them in a smaller space which yeah. means that they're able to fight against the zakals and then you can of course put zakals in front in order to just tank for them and then you kind of just chew through them another way you can go is you can go for amber womb which means that you would go for either incubators or you'd go for resonance incubators are great because they uh, eat they they're capable of taking some of those double damage shots for the rest of your calls. So yeah. you, that you end up with that interaction. Then the third thing you can go for is thrums. And th so you end up with this inter interesting interaction. You end up with thrums being able to beat Amber Wound transitions because Amber Wound transitions struggle a little bit with dealing with thrums and shooting up specifically. You have the, ma you have the Amber Wound transitions are able to deal with the Mass Hunter transitions reasonably well. And then you, because incubator, good unit. And then you have mass hunters, which are able to deal with the thrums really well. Because if you have, mass hunters are pretty cheap. And if you have them in large enough numbers in certain in your base, then you're able to just kind of kill the thrums. And on top of that, you have stuff like Dread Sisters, where you can just root the thrums and then kill them with your mass hunters. And so you end up with this kind of rock, paper, scissor kind of interaction that's really interesting to play with yeah. in, the, in the matchup. Yeah, and also although in this tournament we only saw one, well actually one game total that we saw in the in the cast games at the very least. Uh, yeah, Pigeon Wrench mostly just goes for what was it? Do you remember Don what he went for? Let's see, they were going. Yeah, as it calls into what transition? Because as you they said, there's thrums. Yeah, thrums. they were going hard into thrums. They were very much harassment based. Yeah. So yeah, that's basically a bit the matchup. You have the harassment based options, oh, sorry, very strong options. Okay, Yeti pointed out there was actually resonance, and I completely forgot. My bad. <laughs> okay, so resonant based, so very powerful ground army that can take control positions. Okay, and yeah, say say oh, you. Oh, that's right. Yes, we're watching the game right now. Yeah, I don't know how this goes. Yeah, because at the resonance, and they get yeah. they manage to surround Yeti and take a bunch of their army out. Well, Yeti actually, surrounds yeah. them, but Yeti loses a bunch of their army to the resonance, and then the resonance they all die, but that's fine because it's still an advantage to yeah to Pigeon Wrench in terms of having their army built up. Yeah, it often comes down to, yeah, there you go, Yeti's going for the Frums, but they're not really able to harass because he wants to kill the army of the Resonance right in front of his face. And then reinforcements come in a bit faster and all that. Okay, yeah. And then, finally, uh, so say we have different type of... Sorry, Yeti was the one going for Thrums. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So how would you define the end game? What's what's the ideal end game composition you want to go for in Aru versus Aru? What do you think, Dom? Aru. I know, go I for Zard. 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 Zard's Zard gonna go for it. Has many thoughts on this. <laughs> go for it, Zard. R over Zard. What's your ultimate eight late game composition that you'd want to go for? Okay, it actually really depends on what immortal you have. Okay, let's go for Mala. So if you have Mala, yeah, then you're you're gonna be looking at Dread Sister, Resonant, Behemoth with a couple groups of Thrums wandering around the map, mostly just because like also you'll want Mass Hunters with the upgrade. 
simply because they're just extremely damage dense. Yeah. A couple of incubators as well to go with it. One thing I really like, just generally speaking about Immortals design, is how in-game compositions kind of have some of everything because a few units, like a few spellcaster units, a few force multiplier units, a few of each kind of unit is is like an enormous benefit to an army. So therefore, if you have like two behemoths, that just makes your unit, your army better than not having those two behemoths, assuming the behemoths are upgraded. So... As a result, it's really interesting. And so, if you have, if you're playing Mala, then you can get Incubator, Mass Hunter, the Call, a couple Behemoths, lots of Dread Sisters because of Birthing Storm, and then a few Resonance for Zone Control. That's so like so, seven units or so. Yeah. So in general, it's really you want a diverse composition. You don't want to just mass one or two units. Like, say the Behemoth Wraith Bull uh, meta that we had for a bit. You really want to have a very diverse comp with a lot of stuff from. And then they just synergize well together, basically, right? Yep. If you're playing Zol, then what you're going to look for is a Colix, because a Colix are silly in their ability to instantly kill mass hunters with their projectiles. So They're kind of also all you have right now, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, that's, that's the thing. Great yeah, also can throw some wrenches in Aru versus Aru specifically, because everything Aru has is wrench. That's true. true. As such, if you great hunt and you're in a position in the game where it's not just a call versus a call, and you say you're relying on resonance or something, then you press the button, and then all of their resonance stop firing, and they can't see you, and they can't fire on you, and you can fire on them. So, I mean, at that point, you got to surround them first. That's the, that's the key thing to point out, though, is that if you're going to great hunt, make sure they can't escape. Yeah, right. no, you, you don't want to just, yeah, for sure, you want to right. catch them. It's very good versus zone control. Yeah, definitely. If the resonance can't see you, they can't shoot at you. Okay, so that's Aru versus Aru in a nutshell. So open Zakal, transition into like mass hunters, Z uh, into ma into mass hunters or resonance or frums, and then from there you take you see where you can go and who has the advantage. Frums, of course, more harass focus. Mass hunter, a bit kind of in the middle where resonance will be very powerful against the other two armies if you can set them up right. Uh, so yeah, Aru versus Aru, and of course the meta in general favors very much a very. Uh, expand heavy right you want to open up with an expansion pretty much no matter the matchup sorry what do you what are your yeah. thoughts on that yeah so yeah not much more to add to that you want to expand no matter what you don't want to uh take up of course the yeah. game the game itself is made in a way that you're supposed to have a choice between arm between creating an army and getting the map control to get the power early uh mm -hmm. expanding early so you can you know, get your get your expansion, get your income faster so you can build a bigger army later. Or you can just tech straight away and go for a big rush attack, which uh, we saw in one of the games. It didn't, up, I don't think it ended up working. It was Lightforger versus Magico. Yeah. I'm just going to go. Yeah, she's like that really have to catch your opponent by surprise in order to work, I think. Yeah. As a result, like, otherwise, they're just incredibly difficult to pull off. If your opponent understands what they're looking at, then it becomes very difficult to kill them just because if they go, oh, well, what do I see here? I see no ether. I see units first. I see, um, and I see no expansion after the units. Well, then you can necessarily reduce the possibilities down to various forms of cheese, whether that's going to be a cannon rush or it's going to be two, uh, two legion halls and tari pillar rush. You can kind of just build a form of counterplay and then shut the cheese down just from what you see so that's something that's which result, is, it's the game ends of lending itself more to macro focus at least at this point i think that's a natural result of the defender's advantage element like the fact that it is the game has been designed around having a lot of ways of staying alive against early cheese means that it's and as well as giving you the economy kind of off the bat means that one base isn't that far behind two base but it is far enough behind that it's still worth it to go over two bases. And then if you have two bases, well, you now, you have a bunch of other assets to defend you. So unless you're going really far into just focusing heavily on economy without getting, or heavily on tech without getting units up, you'll have the assets to defend with. Yep. Right. 
So yeah, then well, it part of that's also Lost Province's design as well. Yeah, really facilitates mm -hmm. this. Yeah, because it, it might come down to: Do you want to have tech tech focus on the game? Uh, do you want to have map control and get that power early? Depending if there's less power on the map, you might want to focus on that. But uh, really, hasn't been the case so far where people really want that economy early, the power advantage. Yeah, if you want, if you want the power advantage that early, what you basically are saying is that I'm going to squeeze value out. I'm going to squeeze an enormous amount of value out this specifically like, yeah exactly out of this pyre specifically i get 50 75 pyre and i need to squeeze like 400 any score to squeeze 400 alloy out of this pyre that's yes. a lot that, that's a non-trivial amount of yeah, yeah that's it, killing it, your it power army. Good, but you have to literally wipe your opponent's army with an infuse for that to be worth it yeah and that's yeah. a big ask yeah i, I guess the yeah. style gameplay but at the highest level will really be viable i guess until you uh, until future yeah future friends. We'll, we'll see because also again a lot of its map design yep. lost province is very easy to defend an expansion on yeah for sure whereas maps that are and the other ttp maps are also very straightforward in terms of distance it's i think if it was a map that was less constricted that you'd have a bit more of a trade-off and especially a smaller map that was less constricted like frontiers but with more openings i think you would see more of a choice Okay, so so partly map design is going to change stuff a bit. Okay, that makes sense. Oh, it's it's a huge yeah. There there is currently a build in Karath versus Aru here on Lost Province that will actually just kill. Um, it will straight up kill a expo first, unless the opponent knows how like exactly how to defend it. It's like one of those thin margin of error defenses. Yeah, I, I think we'll have a lot of those as soon as new things come out and. As the game develops, people will have other ways to defend, or there'll just be more tools, actually, as the game develops as well, but also more tools for those cheesy, cheesy Iritech plays of well, as, of well, as well. <laughs> yeah, I feel like Iritech is going to be more of a cheese faction, for sure. Yeah. So, funnily enough, this game goes on until 16 minutes, as uh, as, as uh, Aldo Lightforward takes the advantage, he's playing Orzum, and Orzum often more about getting an early advantage, like it's it's a late game composition you often want right you want to play defensive and get that big sharu count or whatnot especially against aru and yeah that's awesome is a train yeah it takes a long time to get going and it's really hard to stop once it does mm -hmm. yeah and okay let's just show we were talking before we let off as uh the, the stream is about to end we talked a bit longer about giant grand case but i think it was a good talk worth having i want to show off uh the game that wasn't streamed that uh you know the no wait that's the wrong yeah, the crashed game. Let's talk about the crashed game and show off the power of the scepter in that. That was pretty cool. <laughs> Magico says that uh, the game only lasted long because he refused to A move. Okay, I can't believe that, Magico. That's fair. That is true. Yeah. It's not that you just don't want to take the risk, right? We've seen a lot of games end up... Uh... There you go. Crash game. There we go. Thank you, Yeti, for observing this one. It won't be Zard for once. You see the time it goes on. So we had the game until about what? Uh, three minutes in. Yeah, nothing much happening so far. Zakal's yeah, coming. One, there was one push, and the push died. And then it was like, oh, I guess it's even, because one side is Saoshin, the other side is Zakal's. Who knows how this is going to go? That's where we left off. Yeah, so you said generally you can open Mass Hunters to begin off, right, Zard? You can open Mass Hunters in, in uh, Aru versus Croft now instead of uh, just going Zakal straight up. But you still need to go into Zakal's eventually, right? Yeah. It's mostly just because, like, if you only go for mass hunters, then the moment the Soul Foundry finishes, they will have Dervish, and Dervish absolutely destroy anything that has to do with mass hunters. And you can't run away from the Dervish either, because offering it has the same offering mass hunters have the same movement speed as regular old Dervish. So therefore, you get caught out by Dervish, you can't run away even with offering, and this makes it such that it's extremely difficult to make any mass hunter composition work because you basically just have a dichotomy that goes you either kill the dervish or you lose everything <laughs> it is well in any case we're seeing this game come up with uh the zakals finding an opening going for the main base and the, the natural going for the other base as well uh yeah magical has a decent advantage but on the other side the dervish are going crazy because it's santa playing and santa gets his dervish be crazy and yeah. Spin, yeah. Spinny, spin, spin, spinny, spin, 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 yeah. spin, spin, spin. Yeah, and then the mid game here is the mid game. The mid game seems very reliant on getting some harass, and it seems you want to get your harass in and 
build up your big army, get the map control at the same time, get your harass, so multitasking galore everywhere. Yep. Yep. But, and as a call, didn't really do much. They didn't manage to get the kill. They got some, they got a handful of moats, but not a huge amount of damage. At the same time, the Dervish are just doing absolute work on the other side of the map. Yeah, Dervish doing uh, their Dervish things. Definitely advantage was Sana's at this point, but this is where the game crashed. This is where the game crashed. We only had like... Yeah, right, a right after these mass Hunters die, that's when the game crashes. Oh, man. Oh, it goes on. Yeti was still there to record, so thank you, Yeti, for seeing everything. Uh, we see Magical keeping map control at the very least. Uh, but yeah, I just want to go up with the power of the Scepter. We see Santa just building up his Scepter count, and we can see that the Scepter has... Uh, it has, has a really powerful attack. So yeah, not going to spend too much time on this. Yeah, except they're defending the Zakaos. And the final push, Dervish being their same harassy, annoying selves. There you go. That's a new, a new adjective, being a harassy unit. Oh yes, harassy unit is for harassers. <laughs> they're just very harassy. Really harassy. <laughs> the preceptors. Yeah. And we go for the final push. Oh, there you go. They're finally taken out. Santa's devastated. He's going to have to build more, which he will do, obviously, because it's Santa. Mm. And yeah, there we go. Finally, just to push across the map. Finally. Kind of come soon. It's going to defend this. Oh, actually, this is a big loss for Magico if he loses all these units for nothing. And there's not, well, there's nothing defending it, but at the same time, the Scepter's already across the map. So that's kind of doing a lot of the work right now. If yeah. And, one thing yeah. one thing that I like I can credit Santa with is just like how intelligently turtly he is. Like who I don't think there's a single other player that's gonna look at the game state and go, you know what this needs? I while I'm building a giant army, I need a tower right over there in my base <laughs> where the rocks have been broken down. Like the like that, that's super smart and like yeah, he's, he's there. right they do yeah but you don't always think to do that oh yeah the power of the scepter see they still have some mana left so they could uh they could still do use aoe even after that and the dervish commit to finish it off and yeah that magic goes dead so the power of the scepter is here Santa's oh yeah like just dervish, look at the that, that <laughs> movement stuff the fact that they can do a little while moving i think is a really under is a buff it's a small buff but it's very you no know, it's noteworthy yeah it's definitely yeah, I mean, but we have to move it here. Destroyed those mass hunters, yeah. Yeah, well, on that note, uh, today was a bit about 1v1, but we didn't spend that much time. We spent more time with uh, Giant Grand Games uh, video. I mean, uh, to be fair, that is that is a very important video to address. I it mean, is. It's come up seven times for good reason, and it's something that does need to be discussed because all those points, they're very good points, and having that argument on there is... Yeah. Like it's it's good to have that come out before the next wave of strategy games that are currently in development. Yeah, they're quite a few. To release. Yeah, I mean we are in the we are in the era where strategy games are coming out, and we're all looking forward to them as well. So uh, I think on that note we are going to uh, leave you here with one v one. Cat and Chad, thinking, which cat are you talking about? No, it's my mine. cat's sleeping. He's not doing anything. No, okay, no, no, no. <laughs> no he's okay, a cat. Yeah, it's my cat, Melula, Momo. Uh, but yeah, Andre's Andre's sleeping. Mm, yeah, the cats the cats sleep often. So yeah, uh, we talked about one v one. I think next week we'll cover the rest of one v one, how to use it, and everything else. And yeah, if anyone has uh, more suggestions, feel free to join the Immortal Gates of Power Discord. That note, uh, I'm ZK. You can find me on Twitter zk 12 which links to all my other social media. Uh, with me is Dom. I'm at Dominic S on Twitter and Twitch, and Shadow Fury three 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 on YouTube because I was a I was a teenager once. <laughs> And finally, Zard. You can find everything about me just by googling Zardasil. There you go. He's the only. He's the one and only Zardasil. So he's easy to find. Lucky for him. And yeah, on that note, uh, thank you for watching. We'll be back next week at 9 p.m. EST or EDT at this point. I'm not going to convert to other times because, uh, well, you can convert it yourself. Thanks everyone for watching this week's episode of Playing with Pyre. Good night. <laughs>